about the time a sermon series ends is whenever I figure out when to stand up and come up on the video. So if you will, for our last sermon from Psalm 23, turn with me there. Psalm 23, we'll be looking in particular at verse 6 this morning. Psalm 23, verse 6, really thankful uh, this Memorial Day to be here. Glad you are here with us. Thankful for Scott leading us, worship team and worship, uh, even, even those songs speaking directly to our text this morning. And it is good for us to consider not only what the Lord says, but to sing his praise in light of what he has given us. So it is good for us to be here to worship him. Next week, we'll begin our summer series, uh, summer stories, if you will, is what we're calling it, looking at the parables of Jesus. So we'll be walking through some of the parables of Jesus throughout the summer, uh, excited about that opportunity and thinking through how we spent so much time in Acts, the start of the church, the continuing work of the Lord uh, through his spirit and building up and strengthening and and creating his church, which we are, of course, inheritors of. Then looking here at this well-known passage in the Old Testament and how it speaks to us in Christ itself and then spending the summer in some of the Gospels and looking there, just trying to, for us throughout our year to get the taste from God's Word all over God's Word. And so we'll be looking this summer through that starting next week. This morning, though, we want to look at this last verse. I don't know about you, but as I've walked through Psalm 23 again here, I have been encouraged. There are many hectic days around us. And I'm speaking personally in my own life as May is that month where it seems like everything wraps up. December is that month where you have so many events and so many things to go to and you're looking to make sure you got everybody checked off the list and taken care of and just a lot of activities. But May is that month. Now it seems in my uh, season of life, Allison and I, where everything just wraps up. You got school ending, you got next steps for those, we've got one graduating, we've got one in college, we just continue to move on. We got one trailing way behind in the second grade, so it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just life is hectic. And as a parent, not only is it hectic, but I'm looking out at the world and it is more and more uncertain about what may come. I mean, I would like to think there was a day and age where you kind of could predict what may happen, but, but in our world, uncertainty seems to be the thing. I mean, we're just not sure, or the world's not sure about anything. And so you think about what it means to, to move forward. You, you, you think about those things that uncertainty creates some anxiety and other things. Well, it's good for me to rest here in Psalm 23. It's good for me to rest here in this, this psalm that speaks not only how we can trust the Lord, for he is our shepherd, and he leads us, and he guides us, and he comforts us. We can trust the Lord, but just also that not only can we trust him in this journey of life, he also comforts us along the way. And so we trust him to lead us as the good shepherd, and we find our comfort in him as well. The last verse comes as the most comforting of all, I believe. If you consider a sheep and a shepherd, just as we have seen, I mean, you, you consider the fact that sheep journey their whole life. They are constantly, especially in this this time period that David's writing, they're constantly journeying, no fences, if you will, looking from one pasture to another. They're constantly moving, going on, going on, and going on. And their journey will end by being led to the slaughter, right? And so there's some sense in which there's this movement here of the sheep and the shepherd, and they're going over and over again from one place to the other and never finally getting to some rest, getting home, if you will. But that's not the case. Our journey in life, when led by the good shepherd, will lead us to a destination. And that destination, he says, is in the house of the Lord himself. Our journey as the sheep 
with the shepherd of the Lord leading us, will lead us home. I have said this many times, but here in this last verse, you find that statement clearly given to us. And so I want us to read Psalm 23 together again. I'm going to start in verse 1 and read it all. Of course, we'll just be focusing on verse 6 this morning, but I want us to read this together. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. He writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the comfort we find from these words. Not just in, in the words themselves, but what they mean for us. They, they teach us what they show us, that we have a good shepherd who leads us home. Father, may we find comfort in that, even in the midst of a world of confusion and chaos. May the certainty, may the certainty of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, comfort us this morning. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, trusting in the Lord, leading us, being comforted by him, the Lord is my shepherd is that main statement. I mean, it, everything flows from that. I mean, that's what this verse, this whole chapter is about. The Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. Everything flows from that idea. He leads us to green pastures, still waters, restores our soul, comfort in trials, trusting him even in the midst of our enemies, abundance in his grace. All of those things come from our good shepherd, our good shepherd. But what I want to point out even more so, and I, I mentioned this last week, and, and, and Scott even shared it up here as he was leading us this morning, is that the Lord is not only our good shepherd, but he's also our king. This passage is, is teaching us that. He's our shepherd king. And that's important as we look at the context here in the Psalms. Psalm 23 is in the midst of a series of five Psalms, starting in Psalm 20 going through Psalm 24. And this section here, these five Psalms, Psalm 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, they are referred to as the kingship Psalms. They go together. They're speaking of what it means to be a king under the Lord in his power and presence. David is writing these as the king. But what's clear that David believes that is that his kingship is only given to him sustained, upheld by the great king of heaven. So he says, like verse Psalm 20, he looks back and though David is the king, he's looking to the one who's king in heaven. Psalm 20, he says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Or Psalm 21 begins in the same way. Oh Lord, in your strength the king rejoices. And in your salvation how greatly he exults. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. 
David here as the king, the one who everyone has to look up to on earth, is admitting that it's in you, that he, it's in the Lord that he trusts. It's the Lord who has established him. It's the Lord who has put him on the throne. It's the Lord who sustains him. It's the Lord who hears his cries. David, the king, cries out to the Lord. He continues, Psalm 22, verse 28, For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Bringing this then in Psalm 24. In Psalm 24, he tells us of this king who has ascended the holy hill of God and who has who is seated on that holy hill and all of us are to look to him as the one who can sustain us, the one who has conquered. So in the midst of these psalms, these kingship psalms, we recognize that the kingship belongs to the Lord and it's important for us to realize that the one who is shepherding us in Psalm 23 is the king himself. And why I say that is because I want you to understand in your life, the Lord shepherd king does not delegate his duty or subcontract out his promises. He is the one who carries them out. He is the one who bears those loads. He is the one who makes sure that every promise given will be answered and sustained and kept for all eternity. He doesn't give them over to the angels. He doesn't hand them over to any guardians. He doesn't give it to any other thing or creature. He is the one, the Lord, Shepherd King, is the one who makes sure his sheep Lie down in green pastures. He leads them beside still waters. All scripture, as I said, portrays life as a pilgrimage, a journey with a destination. And Psalm 23 is no different here. And as we approach this last verse, we have this shepherd king who is leading us, who's not delegating out his promises, but he himself is leading us. And as we approach this last verse, we are reaching the goal to reach God's house to get safely home. This verse, verse 6, not only points to the end, but it also speaks to the journey itself. Not only is it looking to God's house that we will be a part of, but it's looking back to the goodness and mercy that follows. And so there's three questions about this journey that we have. And, and really in, in a journey, there's always kind of three questions. I'll give these three questions. How will we get there? Y'all know how it goes. How are we going to get there? If we have a journey, how will we get there? Where are we going and how long will we stay? Now, that may not be the order your kids ask it whenever y'all take off on a journey, but it is, those are the three main questions. How will we get there? Where are we going? And how long will we stay? And what I want to seek to do is answer those from, from verse 6. First, how will we get there? We will get there with goodness and mercy following us. We will get there with goodness and mercy following following us. Notice what is not answered in the specifics of this trip. He doesn't say you will get there by car, plane, train, or etc. That's not what he's saying. The implication here is not of how you will get there in the mechanism or the apparatus. Remember back it, it tells us that there are paths of righteousness and we discussed the fact that that this doesn't speak to many paths it speaks to many types of paths and so there'll be many different seasons in your life there'll be many different types of paths that you may have to journey and walk on there will be times that you will be in the valley of the shadow of death and times you will be lying in green pastures and beside still waters there are many different types of seasons and paths in your life so when I say how will we get there I'm not speaking of of the apparatus that will get there. I'm speaking of how the Lord will make sure we get safely home. And in doing that, he's going to follow us every step of the way with goodness and with mercy. Whenever someone would travel in these days, they would never travel alone. They would never take off on a journey by themselves. They would always have what we would call an entourage, especially a king. 
A king, when he would journey, would never journey by himself. He would have those who would go out before him announcing his coming. And, and he would have those who, who follow after him, making sure all that he needed was met and had. And so here we see this as an entourage, if you will. Our shepherd king is our entourage. He is leading us, and goodness and mercy are following along behind us. He's leading us out, and goodness and mercy are coming with us. Following behind us, this goodness and mercy then become important. What does he mean by this? All of us sheep journeying here with the shepherd leading us in goodness and mercy coming. Notice the confidence of the author. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The confidence of the author I already had said, I shall not want. Y'all see that back in verse 1? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now even more comprehensively he speaks, surely, which we'll talk about that word in just a second, goodness and mercy. One pastor calls these, twin, these two things, goodness and mercy, twin guardian angels. Goodness speaks of God supplying all of our needs. When he says that goodness would follow behind us, he's saying that in every step the Lord will make sure in our journey we have everything that we need. Now, let me remind you again, and I'm sure you know this, especially you who have, have grown up and come to maturity, there is a stark difference between needs and wants, right? And so the Lord in his graciousness and goodness is saying to us, all of your needs will be met when you follow this. The Lord is following us with his goodness, making sure that on the journey, there's not one thing that we need that we will lack. The good shepherd makes sure all of our needs are met. All are met. But not only do we have goodness, which he's making sure all of our needs are met, you have mercy. Mercy speaks of the Lord blotting out all of our sins, if you will, all of our mistakes. In other words, goodness is speaking to how he's supplying all that we need. Mercy is speaking, speaking to how he cleans up all of our messes as we journey. He's supplying all of our needs and he's cleaning up all of our messes. And, and, and what does it say about these things? They shall follow me. This word shall gives the same sense of only, only, uh, sh uh, surely, excuse me, gives the same sense as only, only goodness and mercy shall follow me. In fact, if you use this word follow here, uh, some would argue that that idea is too tame. The better way to understand that word follow is pursue. It's the same word that, that, that Pharaoh, is used to Pharaoh whenever he pursued Israel. The same word whenever he was trying to get the Israelites back before he was crushed in the midst of the, the Red Sea. Or it's the same thing of Israel pursuing Midian. Whenever he's going after the armies of Midian, they pursue them. And so, so the scriptures here is saying that surely only goodness and mercy shall pursue me my whole life it, it's it's a it's a more powerful way of saying they're not just following after us they're pursuing after us they're they're helping us along they're they're pushing us as we go goodness God's supplying all of our needs and mercy he's he's cleaning up all of our messes he is surely behind us doing these things all my days it says continually all my life even to the last minute Goodness and mercy shall follow me all of my days. You see, the, the, the imagery here then is of the shepherd, the good shepherd, leading his people, leading his sheep, and following behind him, them as his goodness and his mercy. All of their needs are met. All of their messes are cleaned up. It's the mercy of God that pursues after the sheep when they go astray from him. It's the mercy of God that, that, that goes after those who, who may wander off in the thickets or in the wilderness, off the path. It's the mercy of God who cleans up the mistakes and messes that we have. It's his mercy and it's his goodness. It's his goodness that makes sure we have all of our needs met. Surely, it is sure for the believers 
the goodness and mercy of the Lord are following you every day of your life, every moment of your life. The imagery here is of one who's, who's following a child. And, of course, sheep know that, right? I mean, sheep are like that. They, 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 they're, they're dumb animals. And so they have uh, needs and they don't know where they're going. I, I was reading a story preparing this about how recently, I was reading a story, how recently there was 1,500 sheep on, uh, in Turkey who were wandering around in a field and the shepherds went off to eat just a short while away. Before they could, 400 of the sheep just walked off a cliff and died. And you thought, well, at least there was 1,100 smart ones. No, what happened in the story was 400 walked off to their death, and the other ones walked off, but all the 400 became like a pillow to them, and they just landed on the dead sheep and lived. In so many ways, that's how we can be. Moving on in our ignorance, it's, it's like following after a child, you know, where, where you're putting the food in front of them, making sure they eat it and they get what they need. And then you're making sure they don't pick up something they're not supposed to eat. And you clean up after them and you, you, you take care of what the messes they make. It's that idea that the Lord is caring for us in our journey. Making sure we have what we need. Making sure we, we don't step into something we shouldn't. And when we do, he cleans up that mess. That's how we will go. With the shepherd leading us and his goodness and mercy following us. But where are we going? It's clearly here. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. The end of the journey for us. As he leads us and follows us, the end of the journey for us is to dwell with the Lord. Alexander McLaren, a, a, an expositor on this passage, says this should be at once the crown of all our hopes for the future. And the one great lesson taught us by all the difficult circumstances in life. All of the difficulties that we face, all of the hardships that we face, all of the pain that we go through. It's like Paul writes to the Corinthians, these trials are slight and momentary compared to the glory that awaits us. So we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and we have to sit down and eat amongst our enemies, but we have his house waiting on us. We have this one great thing, all the sorrows and joys, all the difficulties of our journey, all the rest that we have to deal with, all of the relaxation and the struggles that we face will all come to an end. And all of those things, all of our circumstances point to the day when we will dwell with him. This is a call of faith here, a conviction of faith. For David, as he writes, you see, we noticed earlier how he proclaims what the good shepherd will do. He makes me lie down. He leads me beside. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. And then he flips and he starts talking to the good shepherd himself. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. He, he goes from proclaiming what the shepherd has done for him in a testimony to speaking to the shepherd in thanksgiving of how he watches over him and takes care of him. And then he comes back in verse 6 to proclaim this again for all that will hear a conviction of his faith surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever you see the faith that God calls us to the faith that trusts in him for life and salvation is the very same faith that we walk through life with knowing that this is not the end there's something waiting for us that is far better. There's something waiting for us that is far more glorious. We get a table amongst our enemies here, as verse 5 says. We get a feast with the king there at his table. As John 14, Jesus is, is speaking to his disciples and he's seeking to comfort them but also at the same time to tell him what he's about to do. It's that night that he would be betrayed. He's there in the upper room with them, and he's, he's teaching them about what's to happen. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. 
Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. The promise of Jesus is that he's going to prepare a place for us to bring us to himself. As Jesus was leaving his disciples, he says, that's where I'm going. And if we could think about that night, as the old preacher would say, it only took the Lord six days to make all of creation. Can you imagine how heaven will look as he is making that place for us? But I want you to understand this thing. We oftentimes talk about heaven as if the streets of gold are our reward. We oftentimes speak of heaven as if the mansion he prepares for us is our reward or, or whatever we like we will get. We, we speak of heaven that way. I want you to understand that heaven is heaven only because Jesus is there. You see, our reward is not streets of gold and mansions waiting on us. Our reward is Christ Jesus himself and being welcomed into his presence. He's not the ticket to get into the show. He is the reward that we have. Christ is it. He's our satisfaction and he's our comfort and he's our joy. And so he says, I'm going to prepare a place so you will be with me. We rest from all of our labors, all the valleys of the shadow of death, all the enemies at the gate looking to steal, kill, and destroy. We rest from all of that when we are in the presence of our shepherd himself, Jesus Christ. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. God has saved us so he can be with us. And we head to that place he's prepared for that very thing. What this passage is teaching us as we look even to the book of Revelation in a minute is that we will never lack anything. We'll never lack anything. In ordinary times, green pastures and still waters, paths of righteousness. In fearful times, he leads us through that valley of the shadow of death. In dangerous times, he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And for all time, we will be in his presence forever. That's the comfort of this passage. Which brings us to that last question. How long will we stay? Well, you already know the answer. That last word of this, of this passage is forever. This idea of forever. We will stay with him forever. We'll get there with the shepherd leading us in goodness and mercy following after us. And we will stay there forever psalm eighty four ten. for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere one day is better than the thousand elsewhere why is that because in the courts of our king there is no hate there is no violence there is no sickness there is no death there are no cheaters cheaters go to hell do y'all know that Liars do too. No liars, no cheaters, no hypocrites there. You see, all of us will have life and we'll have it everlasting and we have been restored and redeemed. And though we were once dead in our trespasses, though we were once liars and cheaters and hypocrites, all of that has finally and completely been washed clean by our Savior himself, the shepherd, the sheep who died on our behalf been washed clean by him. So the psalmist continues in Psalm 84. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So true, right? Don't we long for the place where there is no more sorrow there, no more burdens to bear? I can get to singing. The only solo I ever sang in church in my life was what a day that'll be. No more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. More than that, 
the one who died for me and brought me safely by his side. What a day that will be. And I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And a day in his presence is better than a thousand years elsewhere. And what he has promised is not a day. He has promised us forever. And what he has told us is that we will not even be doorkeepers in his house. As Revelation 22, 5 says, they will need no light or lamp for the Lord will be their light and they will reign forever. Not a doorkeeper in his presence, but we will reign with him as he promised. How many of us would say today, that's what we long for and desire? Surely it's all of us, right? Surely you've lived long enough to know that this life is not it. There is purpose here and this purpose is found in Christ Surely you've lived up long enough to know that, that it's him who brings joy and satisfaction. And when we die, it's not over. There is an eternity waiting on us. And surely we want to be in his presence. Surely we desire that. If you want heaven then, then Psalm 23 teaches us you better follow him now. For he's the one who leads us there. Not another. Not another. As we close out Psalm 23, look back to those three I statements. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I will fear no evil. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. With the Lord Jesus as your shepherd, my friends, there is no downside. He supplies all of our needs. He cleans up all of our messes. He takes away the fear that this world may close in on us. And he makes sure we are safely home. I was reminded just this morning, praying again as preparing to preach of this passage in Revelation 7. The passage where the saints of God are gathered around the throne all there together and they sing salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. That picture of the end and when all the nations, all of his sheep finally have come home. And listen to what it says in verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. That's the king. He will shelter them in his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The hope of all of eternity comes to us today when we can say, the Lord is my shepherd. May it be true of each and every one of us. May our statement of faith be simply that, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our shepherd king who leads us safely home. God, I pray that there is no one in this place that still stands in want. They haven't found Christ, and so they still desire something greater. They're still looking for satisfaction. Father, today, may they find Christ Jesus, the only one who can satisfy. And may we understand today that if we desire heaven in the future, we must follow you today. So if there's someone here that does not follow you, that does not know you, that has not called upon you as the good shepherd, may they do that just now. May they do that just now. Father, we praise you for your gift of a Savior in Christ. May no one neglect that great gift. May they find his goodness and mercy. 
Thank you, Father. If you're here today and you need to find that goodness and mercy that can only be found in Christ, Pastor Nathan and others will be standing in the back ready to receive you, love to pray with you, love to speak with you about this as we stand up and sing about our good, 